there's only one real way uh, to judge a man's character, and that's which side he would have been on at Marston Moor. And that's a very political uh, question, um, but it basically comes down to do you believe in freedom and democracy or do you believe in autocracy? Some people look for a strong leader to take control and to um, uh, set everything right, but others would like a say in how they're governed. I place myself um, on the liberal wing and the, uh, the, the owners of this um, the owners of this house in, in Wiltshire uh, played an important role in uh, the development of liberalism in, in, in England. The, the fourth Earl of Pembroke, and this is the seat of the, uh, the Pembroke, this is an aristocratic family, it's got nothing to do with, um, uh, this isn't class war, though it has class war elements. This is an aristocratic family and the Earl of Pembroke um, Fourth Earl of Pembroke at the time, in the 1640s, during the English um, Civil War, the Great Rebellion, the, what the Marxists call the English Revolution, had a role to play. Um, he was for Parliament, but he um, he was a moderate. He's also he's very similar to another interesting character that I talk about quite often, John Hampton, who also. Um, who was killed in the English Civil War in a, a skirmish in Chalcum, something like that. Um, and the course of history might be different if he survived. But both of these people were for democracy, for the development of... Um, there was no such thing as liberalism at the, at the time, but in, in enlightenment, um, the idea of being governed by elected representatives or a plurality, or a, a broad um, discussion, um, what do you call it, a, should we call it a colloquy, and because of that uh, we have the, the political system we have today. Now of course it, it ended in, in the English Civil War, ended in tyranny, um, but this, uh, this character, uh, the, the fourth Earl of um, Pembroke, had a role to play in um, trying to smooth the edges of that. Now, he was on the Committee of Public Safety, which is basically a, a, a junta um, during, the, um, during the English Civil War. He um, was one of the few lords that had, had a role in that. Um, but I'm here to... It's, you have to acknowledge, even though uh, billionaires, and if you've been alive today, you would have been a billionaire. Billionaires are the shame of this country. It, it, um, I'm glad that liberalism developed into uh, laborism in the sense that we could use taxation to redistribute wealth in a more fair way, to distribute um, responsibility and um, taxation in, a, in an ethical manner. Um, but these people are, in, are important because they didn't just say stuff, they did stuff. They put their bodies on the line. There were, there were uh, people like John Hampton and um, uh, the fourth Earl of uh, Pembroke put their, they supported a rebellion. It was treasonous. History has, history has protected them because they won. I mean, they didn't win for more than you know, 20 years, but it, it, uh, it reshaped English democracy. Uh, British democracy. Um, it wasn't, of course, those things at that time weren't just about um, uh, politics. It was the ethics of the time were flavoured by uh, religion. Um, uh, religion had a lot to play in which side you would have been on. Uh, the divine right of kings, um, and if you were Protestant, you were about individual liberty, um, self-determination, all that sort of um, Self-governance. The, the, the Presbyterians are very interesting, uh, but he was a—he was a—he had Puritan leanings, but he was a, a, a Protestant. So, um, so yeah. So, 
I thought I'd come along here and, and uh, have a look at um, have a look at uh, his house, this beautiful uh, Palladian um, uh, bridge. This is also the, the very, very cusp of uh, um, a sort of you know we're entering the age of age of enlightenment um, from um, early modern and medieval ideas, and you can see this illustrated in this um, beautifully proportioned and um, uh, sophisticated um, artistic rendition in stone. Um, across the River Nadder. I'd also like to mention I did try and see whether or not I could find any slavery involved in uh, these aristoc aristocratic families. You know, shortly before and after the Civil War did have big roles to play in slavery. I couldn't find anything, that's not to say it doesn't exist, um, but uh, it would be worth um, having a closer look. Uh, but he, he certainly doesn't seem as um, his son or grandson did have a role to play with the Royal Africa Company, which is the, the big slavers. The house has to do um, quite a hard job to make itself not look like a great big lump of stone stuck straight in the landscape. But it's, it's a bit of weathering a couple of hundred years and it fits perfectly. This, this, this place seems to have a couple of periods, but it, um, um, the internet tells me it was rebuilt in 1647, but I think there's some um, later, later bits. But it melds together quite well, uh, proportions. A little bit of sort of English gothicness about it, um, a little bit, oh, Tudorish, um, and uh, you know early modern as well as Enlightenment values, and it fits together um, like a glove. The bridge um, back there is, is is Palladian style, the latest fashion in proportion, and and um, I'm trying to remember those those key words for for that sort of. Um, style of architecture, uh, sublime, you know, ordered, um, uh, an essence of calm and um, sustainability is not the right word, eternal values, you know, um, uh, there's nothing, you know, rational uh, enlightenment values, uh, 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 looking to a Roman past and bringing it into the future. It's on the, um, the river uh, Nadder, um, in Old English, this Nodra. Um, uh, you wouldn't expect me not to put a bit of Old English into this video. Um, but sublimity, order, uh, timeless values aren't necessarily art. And um, it is beautiful. Um, whether or not it's great art, I don't know, but it's a. It, it's a I certainly wouldn't put my, turn my nose at owning, at owning it, though I expect it might take quite a lot of cleaning. The, uh, the gardens were supposed to have been um, um, laid out by uh, Inigo Jones, but it's, it, it does seem to be somebody else, um, maybe the designing or whatever, but um, just like they're, they're, they're very keen to express that, but whether or not, I don't think he actually did any work here. Um, but it's the, the English landscape style. There would have been formal gardens here at one point, but obviously again that takes a lot of effort. But anyway, I thought uh, I'm not here just to, just to do uh, early modern um, revolutionary politics. It's worth um, uh, mentioning that the, uh, the fourth Earl of uh, Pembroke was Charles I jailer, in essence. He was given um, control over the house where um, Charles I, um, if, you, if you didn't know already, Charles I was executed after the English Civil War. But he refused to have any role to play in his trial. Um, one of the reasons he might have been chosen to be um, 
the one uh, controlling the house that, that Charles was put in was um, may very well have been um, because they were friends um, uh, sort of 20 years before the war. It was politics and religion that, that caused um, a, a schism between the two um, and may very well have had um, something to do with the Catholicism of Charles I's wife. Um, but the Stuarts tried to um, to go in that direction for for some time, even after you know the pretenders to the throne afterwards um, tried um, uh, to go in that direction, and the, the the British, the English, and the Scots wouldn't have it.